Hello everyone and welcome to another Fusion 360 Live. My name is Brad Tallis. Um, unfortunately, I'm going solo today. Angelo had a uh, prior commitment, so he will not be on chat. So I'm probably gonna have to kind of look over and see what's going on. Hopefully, I'll be able to answer your questions as we're going through. Um, today's topic, I'm gonna be talking about 3D printing inside of Fusion 360. Not a lot of people know that you can actually slice and set up a machine and print are all from Fusion 360. Now I'm not a professional um, at any of this so I'm just going to be kind of giving you a, a kind of a high level. Um, they are constantly working on this area and they're going to be adding more and more functionality so keep an eye out for that. Before we start I'm actually going to show something from my live stream last week. I talked about creating custom materials in Fusion 360 and check this out. This is actually from a student um, who's attending Carnegie Mellon right now. So this, I showed how to create these custom materials and check out what he did with some of this, um, the stuff that he learned from that live stream. Just absolutely incredible. Uh, rendered in Fusion. Notice he did like depth of field, the really cool materials and stuff. It just takes it to the next level. Um, this actually looks like a photograph. This is a rendering. So, um, and in fact, here's a close-up, and you'll notice even the, the chips and the worn edges and everything. Just absolutely incredible. And then he even did, um, using the form tools, he created these gummy bears, or a gummy bear, and added different materials to them. And then just for fun, he basically, you know, cloned or copied those and created, I mean, it looks like you could just reach into the screen and eat those so anyways I thought those were pretty cool wanted to share those just so you could kind of see what people are doing with uh, what we're um, teaching in these live streams okay um, the other thing is I'm actually using a part and this is kind of a, a personal project here um, I saw this and I thought it was really kind of cool um, so this guy shows how he made this, um, and I'm not going to play the video or anything like that, but it's kind of like, um, you know, just LEDs that travel along, and um, he designed the parts in Fusion 360, so I actually have that part. Um, in fact, let me bring it back up here, sorry, wrong button. Um, this is the part that he designed, and this is what we're going to be 3D printing. Um, in fact, pardon the, uh, the camera sway here, but you can see I already have it hanging up on the wall. I don't have it wired or anything like that. There's my, my messy table, but there's the 3D printer I've been printing everything on. Um, in fact, here is one of those pieces right here. Um, and so I'm going to show how I went about modeling. You know, I didn't model it, but I brought it into Fusion 360 and printed it on that printer using Fusion 360. Here's another example. This is a generatively designed bracket that was 3D printed. Okay, let's switch over to the screen here. So, you'll notice I'm in Fusion 360 and I'm going to you know, say this is what I want to print. Now, a lot of you already know about, if you go into the Tools menu, right here under the Make menu is 3D Print. And I used to do this quite a bit also. It's actually very, very powerful. It allows you to select your the mesh that you want to 3D print and then you can send it to a 3D print utility so for example I use Cura um, I also use Idea Station um, or I'm sorry Idea Maker um, you can see other ones in here Repetier Host and Custom for example and what if, if I were to just hit OK it would actually send this right to the Cura slicer well what I'm going to be showing today is that we can actually slice right inside of Fusion 360 and to do that, we're going to go into the Manufacture Workspace. So I'm now in the Manufacture Workspace, and by default, we usually start in this Milling tab. But you'll notice there's Turning, and then there's Additive, <laughs> and Inspection, etc. But I'm going to spend today in the Additive tab. You'll also, it's very similar to how you would just do a regular part, um, you know, on a CNC machine. You're going to start with a setup. It's going to create the toolpath for us automatically. And then we can come in and edit and change that. So let me just walk through those steps. Now for me, um, as I was doing some testing and stuff like that, 
I ran into a problem when I would print, it would print in the corner like really tiny small. And what I found out is my units were set to inch. Once I changed them to millimeters, then it printed the correct size. So just um, a heads up. It might be the um, post processor that is doing that. It might be, um, in fact, it's probably the post processor that's doing that. So just be aware if you go to print and it doesn't seem to be working, check your units and maybe change them to millimeters. So I'm gonna do that first. In fact, you'll notice right here, my units are in inches. I'm going to change that to millimeter. Say okay. Now it didn't scale or anything like that. It just, I'm now <laughs> referencing millimeters. So I'm gonna create a new setup. And then you'll see something kind of weird happen. I, I kind of see this block or whatever. Well, that's gonna change as we get moving on here. So I'm now in my setup menu or my setup dialog. And the very first thing you see is machine. And I can select the machine. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on select. Okay. So this is going to bring up my machine library. Now, you'll notice it brought up the latest one that I've been using. So I have an AlphaWise U21 printer. That's what I showed you earlier over to the right of me. But I'm going to click on this Fusion 360 library. And I have a filter for additive. If I turn that off, it's going to show like a whole bunch of them. You'll see my scroll bar gets really long. Like you can see all the Haas machines and all that kind of stuff. Obviously. All I want to see are the additive machines. And now you're going to see the different technologies, SLA, FFF, SLM, etc. So I could even filter for those. I'm not going to in this case, just so you can kind of see all of these. And I'm just going to kind of scroll down and you'll notice that we have, you know, ANET, um, AnyCubic, the Big Rep, a bunch of the Creality, you know, like a CR10 the Ender 3, Ender 5, etc. And then you'll see form labs. And notice the form labs actually have little pictures next to them. Um, you can actually add pictures of the 3D printer uh, into this library. The rest of these are just kind of like the default blank ones. So I'm gonna keep going. So you'll see the HP, Prusa, the Ultimaker series, and then the DaVinci series. Okay, now, You'll notice in here, I'm going to go to the this GTEC. I have an AlphaWise U20. Now it is from GTEC, but you don't see the U20 in here. What's cool is that these actually have the post processors and you can start with this and edit and tweak it if you need to. And that's exactly what I did. So let me show you how I went about doing that. I, I just clicked on this A20 and you'll notice up here I can say copy selected. So I'm going to say copy the selected. Then I'm going to go to my machines. And what that's going to allow me to do in this cloud, I can now come in and paste. So I'm going to go ahead and hit paste and it's going to paste that in there. Okay. And it gives me some information. Who's the vendor? What's the model? What's the dimensions? So it's a 250 by 250 bed with a height of 250. Okay. But now I can come in and I can edit this. So if I click on this, you're going to see I could, you know, give it a name. I could, I'll call it, you know, U20 Part 2 or something like that. You know, um, I can fill all this information out, what my platform clearance is, how many extruders there are. If I even have a 3D model of the platform, and you'll see that as we go through, I could bring in that 3D model of the platform, and that's what my models are going to sit on. And then this is what I was talking about earlier with the image. I could go ahead and find an image of the printer, open it up, and it will display it. I'm not going to do that right now. Dimensions, I can click on the dimensions tab over here. And sure enough, you can see it says 250 by 250 by 250. Well, mine is 300 by 300 by 400. And the home position, I'll leave it at 10, 10, 10. I'll just say OK. And now you can see the machine settings, the machine dimensions are 300, 300, 400. Okay. 
Um, so I just glanced over at the chat and AL asked, what printer am I using? And, and it's this exact one you see right here. Um, in fact, I um, did a review of this printer um, out on my personal um, YouTube channel. So you can look for it in there. So just search for Fusion 360 Brad Talis. Look in the videos and you'll see I did a review and I kind of talked about the pros and cons of this particular printer. Okay. Um, and then notice right here, it's using this GTEC post processor, right? Now we're, we can come in and edit how is the printer going to act in you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, is it doing rafting? Is it doing a skirting? All that kind of stuff. So we're, we'll leave that alone for now. But this is basically how you add in your own machine. Start with something pretty close. A lot of machines are based off the Creality um, series, so you can kind of start out with maybe a Creality series. Um, notice mine has an image, so it kind of looks pretty cool here. It kind of shows this is the exact printer, what it looks like. You can see it has a pretty tall um, Z-axis, so it can print some pretty tall, you know, 400 millimeter tall um, objects. So I'm going to select this as my um, printer. And just again, quick review, if I go to this library, I can see all of the other ones that are available. And I could start with any of those and tweak them if necessary. Now you'll notice it says My Machines Cloud. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you have a preference set. And I'll show that here in just a second. So notice what happened now that I've selected my machine and it tells me what it is right there. Notice this preview kind of changed a little bit. And this gray tray that you see here, that's that 3D bed mesh that I was talking about. So you could actually model it to be you know, flat or thinner, like it's a glass plate or a heated bed or whatever. Um, you can actually model that if you want to. OK, that preference I was talking about. I'm going to go up to my initials or my picture, go to preferences. And I always have to remember where it is. So under Manufacture, Enable Cloud Libraries. You will definitely want to have this turned on. OK, so make sure you have that turned on. And that's how I was able to um, pick that machine. Okay. I could edit it if I needed to. I've already shown you how to do that, where it allows me to change the size, etc. And then you see print settings. So I'm going to click on print settings. Right now it shows I'm using PLA, the 1.75 millimeter, 0.4 nozzle. And so you can see here we've got some default materials. So ABS, CPE, some PLA, PVA, etc. And then also notice PLA, um, 1.75, millimeters, right? Um, but I don't see a 0.1 millimeter height. So this is a 0.2 millimeter height. This is showing that here. I can do the exact same thing. I could copy this, this selected material, okay? go to the cloud. In fact, you see I've already done that, but I'll go ahead and in here and paste this in. So now you can see I've got a 0.2 and a 0.1. So I could edit this guy. And, and we're going to spend some time in this a little bit later also, but you can kind of see that we can specify what the layer height, what the extrusion width is, etc. for the extruder. So I could have, uh, for example, a, a coarse, a medium, and a fine. So I might have like a 0.3, a 0.2, and a 0.1, for example, different layer heights, um, or different, I should say, different materials or print settings. And then that's what we will use when we print. So I'm gonna go ahead and let's just do the, the 0.2 millimeter. Okay, I'll select that guy. And, I don't, oops. Don't know why it switched on me. Um, okay. And it looks like I accidentally started something in the background. So let me close that out. Okay. 
So we've done the machine, we've done the print settings. Obviously we're gonna do an additive um, operation type. The you'll notice it says arrangement automatic. So I can print multiple objects. So if I had multiple 3D models and I had them all selected, they'll all come in and get arranged on this platter. We're just gonna do one for now. And I'll just go ahead and say okay. So watch, because arrangement is automatic, when I say okay, it automatically puts it right in the middle. Now you're probably looking at this going, well, that's not how you'd want to print that because it would require support material. And this is actually a pretty simple model. Obviously, we'd want it to be flipped 180 degrees. So notice over here on the left, you know, it says cam root. Here's my models. Here's my setups, just like you see in the regular uh, manufacturing workspace. But if I expand open this setup, we now see um, the printer. And you'll notice this little eyeball. So I can turn that printer on or off. So you can kind of see how it does that. I can see what I'm using. And then you'll notice this adaptive toolpath. And it has a warning next to it saying, hey, there's no toolpath yet. And we're going to spend some more time with this here in just a second. So we've done the setup. Now we can come into the position. And just like in other slicers, we can move components. So what's the component? This guy here. I could rotate it manually if I wanted to, 180 degrees. Okay, I can position it, locate it wherever I want it to be on my platter. Okay, I just canceled it out. But I wanted to show this, automatic orientation. This is actually pretty cool. Now this is, designed more for when you're doing kind of like the um, 3D metal, metal um, centering and stuff like that, where it might have to be supported at an interesting angle to minimize waste. That's what this automatic orientation does, but I'm gonna show it with this guy here too. So I'm gonna say automatic orientation. Um, so what's my target, that guy there? I can specify what my critical angle is. Do I want to support the bottom surface? And you'll notice this is checked. So if I leave this checked, it's actually gonna lift it off of the bed five millimeters and print support. Well, in my case, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to turn that off. I can specify what the smallest rotation is. And I can even specify, is there a specific rotation axis that I want to force it to, to use, X or Y? I'm gonna leave it arbitrary. And then if I jump over into this ranking tab, you can actually rank how is this going to get oriented. And again, this is typically for when you have more than one part and maybe you're doing the, the complex 3D printing. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the live stream that Angelo did like two weeks ago on that SRAM um, crank arm for the bike. There was a clip in the video that he played where it showed they had 3D printed a whole bunch of those on a platter um, using that, that metal, metal printing um, methodology. And it was kind of a cool example because they're kind of all at a certain angle and that's kind of what they're doing here. So I could specify what the ranking is. You know, do I, do I care very much about the support volume or the part height or whatever you can rank them. Again, I'm gonna leave everything alone. I'm just gonna go ahead and hit okay. And you'll see it's gonna get going to calculate, and it did it pretty quickly, um, different orientation solutions. So if I right mouse click and I say orientation results, notice instantly it flipped over. It's sitting right on the, on the bed. And I'm gonna kind of go through these ranks really quick. Now, some of them will be the same. So like two looks exactly the same, but if I go to three, you can kind of see it rotates a little bit. Now notice four, and it kind of colors it red. So again, it found, found I think 14 different ways it could orient this model. But again, I probably wouldn't want to print it this way because it would require support, but it's basically finding like planar faces that could sit flat on the bed, that kind of a thing. So obviously I'm going to pick rank one. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all the rest of these, but basically it just gives you many different results. So actually that's kind of cool because it kind of shows it at, a, at an angle there. So different, different options on how you could orient this for 3D printing. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, okay. 
and it's now placed that flat on the platter. Okay. The other option in here is you can say place parts on platform. So if it was floating out in space, it would force it to sit flat on the platter also. And then you could check for collision detection if you have a whole bunch of parts, are, there in, are they intersecting at all? Um, again, we have one part, so that doesn't make much sense. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and generate this additive toolpath. So I'm gonna to click on generate. And it's almost like you're doing a machining toolpath, you know, for cutting out a piece of aluminum or whatever. You see it, it did an adaptive toolpath. Tells me what my print time is gonna be. And now I can come in and simulate. So I can either click on the simulate up here or I could right mouse click and do the simulate here. And it shows me the preview. So here is my very first layer, layer one, tells me what the thickness is. Now I'm gonna just kind of scrub through so we can kind of see what's going on here. So it tells me the different layers. We also see different colors. So we can see that, for example, this purple is a skirt brim. So I have a, a skirt brim, and if I zoom up on that, we can see you know, where that's located. We can see the infill. I'll go ahead and scroll up a little bit more. We can see we're using a gyroid infill. So you can see all that kind of stuff. I can also come in here and hit play and it'll actually play per layer. And again, I can slow this down if I want to. I can see you know, how much time is it gonna take for, for that particular layer to print, what the current time is, what the current height is, and the layer count, which I think is really, really impressive. Different options in here, display up to current layer or display current layer only. So you can see we could do one layer at a time if you wanna see that. Animation, do we do the full model or just layer only? Um, and you can see basically just does that one layer and stops. <laughs> or you can say animate full model and it'll just keep stacking and working its way up. So a couple different options there for the preview. Okay, so let's continue across. We now have the print settings. So like I said before, um, I can select my print settings, which I already did. So let's go ahead and edit our print settings. And we saw a little bit of this earlier. So broken down into different tabs. So what extruder are we using? We only have one. What's our layer height? extrusion width, and then our infill density. So right now it's set to 15, and we're also using the gyroid infill. So let's, let's crank this up to like 70 or something like that. I'll say okay, and you'll noti notice it dirtied my toolpath. So I just need to come over here and regenerate that toolpath, and it'll go ahead and calculate that. You can probably hear my machine cranking away in the background. Okay, I see a lot of questions coming through. Um, hopefully, I'm gonna I'm gonna plead for some help here since I'm going solo here. Um, if there's anybody on that's watching this that knows the answers to some of these questions, please feel free to answer those. Um, I would greatly appreciate that. Um, but I'll, again, hopefully, I'll have some time at the end to kind of filter through and take a look at those questions. So, okay. So it did the toolpath. We can see it says 119. Let's go ahead and um, simulate. And we should see a finer um, gyroid infill. And sure enough, we do. You can kind of see much tighter infill, including in the arms, that kind of a deal. So just like if you're used to other slicers, it's very, very similar to that. Um, so again, I'll go ahead and edit those print settings. I'm going to change that back down, let's just say 20. Now what's kind of cool is we have some pretty interesting um, infill patterns. So gyroid I use quite a bit, I like it, it prints really fast on my printer. But you can do like honeycomb and rhombic dodecahedron and um, rhombus 3D. I mean there's just a bunch of different ones in here, so let's just do like the rhombus 3D. Um, I'll, let's just do, you know, I'll just leave it 20, let's just see what that looks like real quick. 
And then we'll move on through the other settings. So this one looks like it's calculating a little bit faster um, than the gyroid did. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So we'll simulate, scrub through, and so you can kind of see, sure enough, it's like a 3D pattern. And if we kind of zoom up, you can kind of see what that looks like. Kind of neat. So again, lots of different options in here for the different infills. Okay. I'm going to go back to gyroid. Again, I, I would show all of them, but it takes some time to calculate. It's kind of fun just to go through and take a look at that. I'm not going to show every single command in here, but there's some really important ones, like what's my travel speed? Do we enable a raft? Do we enable support um, if it needs it? I can randomize the perimeter start point. That way I don't get kind of like a zipper seam um, on the edge of my part. Um, so I can randomize it if I want to. Do I have a nozzle wipe station? I don't on mine, so I'm just gonna leave that alone. Um, and then you can see, we can come through, again, I'm not gonna cover everything, but what's our default bed temperature? What's my retraction length? Um, that seems kinda high, I might change that. Um, layer, so how many perimeters? And you can actually see that, let me um, simulate this again. I'll say okay. Um, Generate real fast, and then we'll simulate. So you can specify um, how many perimeters you have, and it even shows it in that color preview that I was showing earlier. And I'm gonna zoom way up, but you can kind of see this red line and this green line. So the red line is this outer perimeter, and then the green is the inner perimeter. And so that's basically you know two wall thicknesses, and you can kind of see as I scrub up what that looks like right there. Okay. Um, so yeah, do the inner perimeters first. What's my default layer one height? Number of top shells, etc. I mean, you can see lots of options in here. Layer one speed multiplier. Notice it's 0 0.5. This means the first layer is going to go half the speed um, for making sure the adhesion goes down really well. Um, rapid Z lift, I don't have that turned on. Uh, infill, we've already kind of talked about, but here you can kind of see what's my infill angle, what's my infill speed, skirt or brim. So number of skirt or brim layers. Now, this is um, something I haven't figured out yet. Actually, I haven't had a lot of time to play with this. I either do a skirt or a brim, and I can't figure out how to tell it to do one or the other. It kind of looks like it does a skirt brim, is basically what it looks like. It's attached to the model. I already, uh, shoot, I already pulled it off of this guy, um, but it was attached to the model. I like to have a little bit of spacing um, next to it. So hopefully I'll figure that out and I can share that with you guys. But you can kind of see, um, you know, the skirt brim distance, minimum length, what's the width, etc. Again, very similar to other um, slicers, rafts. I used to um, not use rafts very much until um, I, I found some settings. Now I haven't tried them in here yet. I, I have them set in Cura, and it actually breaks off of the raft really, really easily. So I might see if I can move those numbers over here. And then obviously under the support, lots of options under here. And if you hover over, it'll actually tell you, you know, what's the angle for surfaces steeper than what should be supported? Um, you know, what is the seam width, extrusion width, etc. You can change your speeds, bridging, cooling, number of layers. The fan is disabled, so I have the first layer um, turned off because I like it to adhere to the bed. I have a heated bed. Um, and then once it's adhered, then I turn the fan on. Um, some people will wait until layer two or layer three. I've had good luck with layer one, just my personal preference. Um, and then the number of seconds that it should take to print each layer. And that gives you 
Um, like for example, if you're printing a pyramid and you're coming to a point, it'll actually slow down when it's printing that, that top point, otherwise it just kind of melts into a glob. <laughs> Um, and then some options, you know, start at the home position. Are we doing you know, arc optimizations, um, verbose G code, etc.? Okay. okay, so that is the um, print settings. Now the infill is exactly like I showed before. Um, you can see all of the different options in here. And then you can see I could open my print settings, but I can basically specify what I want my, uh, my default um, infill to be. Supports, same thing. It kind of just brings up all the information about the supports and allows me to specify are they enabled or not. And in, in this case, there's really nothing in this design that would require it to have supports, so I could disable my supports for this particular print. And then, honestly, that's literally about it. So we come here, you can see we can generate the toolpath, just like in the regular manufacturer workspace. We can simulate the work, uh, the toolpath. So we'll go ahead and do um, the simulate, just like I showed before, with my settings that I did. Again, I don't have any support in this example. But I will in the next one, I'll show that. Um, and then I can post process. So let's go ahead and post process this. You'll notice I can even post process from my simulation. I'll just go ahead and click here and you'll notice it is using the GTEC post processor. I can give it a name. So let's just, I'll call this um, live stream. Um, let's open it when it's all said and done. And we'll call it live stream. And you'll see it's a very verbose um, G code output. Shouldn't take too long. It's going to bring it up in brackets for me. And we can see it's using Marlin. What's the printer name? Um, all the information here. And then here is all of the G code. So you can see G28, G21, the G90. Here is the, uh, oh, actually, and I should talk about this. It actually does a prime um, for me automatically. So when it first prints, it actually prints a, a line along the front of the platter right here to kind of prime the nozzle. And then it goes over and it starts to print. And then obviously the G code. And we can see that sure enough, it's in millimeters. Okay, so let me jump over here and let's do something a little bit more complex, something like this guy. I'm going to do the exact same thing. Go into Manufacture. I will fit to my screen, create a setup. Doesn't know anything, so it kind of just does a bounding box basically. I'll select my machine. I'm going to go a little bit quicker since you've already seen all this, but I kind of wanted to show the supports because obviously in that kind of a object I'd want to have um, some support going on. So I select my machine. It's going to automatically arrange it. I'll say OK. Now it does have flat. Oh, and this is the other thing I thought was really cool that we do. You can actually see through the bottom platter. And some of the other slicers you can't see underneath. But the fact that I can kind of see that sure enough there's some flat faces that it's going to sit on. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, okay. So let's expand this guy open. Um, I'm going to go into my print settings and make sure. OK, so I'll do that. I'll go into my supports. Supports is turned on. I'm just going to leave everything default for now. And let's just generate this uh, toolpath. So literally, I said, use this particular printer. It auto arranged it on the bed for me automatically. And now I'm slicing it with my default print settings, which happens to be gyroid infill, ha happens to be this particular bed temperature, this particular speed, etc. So I'm not having to do a lot to uh, create this 3D print. Now you'll notice it's taking longer because this is a, a more complex model. 
Um, so we're, I'm probably only going to generate the toolpath maybe once in this case, but we can see we're at 90%. So let me glance over. Um, so AL asks, does it support tree supports? Um, excellent question. Sorry, my camera got tweaked a little bit. Um, so yes and no. What you're seeing right now, it does not. Um, but we do have the um, additive extension where a lot of um, technology is putting into there. So that does have tree supports. Um, you'll probably see an example of this down the road. I'm gonna bring in a special guest to talk about that. Um, but in this one here, it, it does not have tree supports. So, um, yeah, and then Al also asked, is there no NC program feature? Not that I saw. <laughs> Now you can create a manufacturing model, which is pretty interesting. I'm not gonna do it, but it basically allows you, if you read this, um, it's basically used for creating like a manufacturing model for an additive workflow that resembles the final part or what we call a near net shape. So you can actually modify the original model to print differently. Maybe it has holes, maybe it doesn't have holes, but you're not really modifying the original model. So it, kind of a neat option but so no we don't have the NC program so good question okay so here is my toolpath this is three and a half hours let's go ahead and simulate this and it should look a little bit different than that other part so notice I'm gonna go ahead and scrub this up a little bit so it's doing the support material I'm gonna keep scrubbing up and now you can see the actual 3d model being printed oops sorry and some of the stuff that I think is really cool you can see how it's like where it's sloping up it's adding some extra material there um, where necessary and right there there's some support material on the inside of this hole here so you can kind of see that going on there so and we can see that sure enough the support is in this you know cyan this light cyan color okay now I'm not gonna change a lot of the settings and regenerate because as you saw on more complex models it can take you know 20 30 seconds or whatever uh, or longer or shorter <laughs> depending um, so I don't want to waste you guys time on that but you can kind of see this one does have the uh, support material you can see the skirt going all the way around like so and then the gyroid infill and that gyroid infill is pretty pretty substantial I mean this is pretty strong <laughs> so I'm like I'm really flexing it and you can barely see it flexing so it's pretty impressive okay um so honestly, that is, uh, well, I mean, let me just cover this manage menu um, just to kind of show you, you can um, go into your machine library. You can go into the post library. You can even create templates. So if I go into my machine library, a lot of this is gonna look very similar. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but this is where I can specify which machine I want to use, which I've already shown. Um, if I go into my post library, so here are all of the different posts. So you can see ABB, ANET, etc., Mach 3. So this is all of them. So I would probably want to do additive. And so we can see here's the Ultimaker, the Prusa, GTEC. So this is the one I was using, Creality. Um, you know the generic FFF machine, any cubic, you can see a bunch of different ones in here. Template library, I have not, I have not played around with this. Um, I don't know if it actually works for 3D printing. You can see right here it just says milling 2D. So you can create templates for, for like drilling holes, tapping holes, etc. I don't know if you can do anything with 3D printing. Like I said, I have not played with this very much. Print setting, I've already just shown that. But then you can export your defaults. And I thought this was really cool. So if I get my machine set up the way I really liked, like it, I could export this out and share it with other people or have a copy of it, etc. And then you'll also notice we have 
this FFF post creation utility. So this will actually allow me to, and I have not played around with it, but allows you to basically edit your posts. Okay, so, um, so you can kind of see here, what's my start program. So maybe I have LED lights or something like that that I want to turn on uh, when it starts to print. Uh, maybe I want it to prime off of the table or something like that. I could specify that here and my end G code also. So, um, and that's about it. So, <laughs> um, I am actually quite impressed. Um, I did, I'll be honest, I ran into some issues when I first started out. It, I could see it start to print and then it would just print really, really small. Once I got that figured out, then it worked perfectly. And it's literally amazing that I can, you know, model something in Fusion and do the G code in Fusion and throw it over to my machine and have it print. And I don't have to have another piece of software to do that. It's all included in Fusion 360. Um, and like I mentioned before on one of AL's questions, we, we are gonna have this um, additive manufacturing um, extension and it's gonna do some incredible stuff. Um, basically, we're taking the NetFab technology and bringing it into that extension. So different infills, uh, variable infills, all this kind of stuff. Again, I'm not gonna talk too much about that. I'll probably have somebody demo it for you um, down the road. So I'm gonna glance over at the chat and see if there's any that I'm able to um, answer. Like I said, I'm not a professional on this. Um, okay. So somebody asked, um, why is my Prusa printing a 0.15 layer height in Fusion when I told it to be 0.1? Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I would check Basically what we always tell everybody is when you run the simulate, um, notice layer one is 0.3, right? And I'm just gonna jump ahead to the next operation. There's layer two is 0.5, layer three is 0.7. So you can kind of see, I can see what these are. So 0.7, 0 0.9. So obviously we're going up 0.2 each time. Um, and my first layer, which I had specified, need, needed to be thicker because that's my uh, main layer. So I would check your simulate and see if it is giving you different numbers. Um, and then it's probably some setting in your print setting. So I would check that. Um, somebody asked, do you have a setting for the amount of filament used in grams? So um, at this time, no, so you can kind of see we do the layer, time, etc., but we do not um, show the, you know, it used 16 grams of, or 13 meters of material. So, and, and yeah, I'll, I'll be honest, there are some things that, for example, Cura has that I really like that we don't have in Fusion quite yet, um, but the, the fact that, I mean, it's, Cura takes, for whatever reason, takes a long time to load on my machine, um, I can just design something in Fusion and send it over. Um, I don't have to open up anything else and figure out, am I, you know, and for example, every time I load up Cura, there's a new version, there's a new version, all that kind of stuff. So I'm always updating. Um, so I, I'm starting to really like the, the Fusion slicer. In fact, there's even some YouTube videos out there where um, some major people like Maker, Maker's Muse and I can't remember some of the other people, um, have done videos on this saying, I wasn't quite sure when I first started, but this is pretty cool. So you might check those out too. Okay. Um, I don't know where we have some extra minutes here. So I'm just kind of going through. Yeah. So like Justin said, you know, he has a, um, he's using the Prusa um, it doesn't have support for trees yet. Once Autodesk gets that, I'll be using it. I totally agree. Um, yeah, James McDonald said that's what the skirt brim distance is for. So, um, 
in the settings for the skirt brim distance yeah so right here I have mine set to zero is this my because I actually have mine set to like three originally so I might be pointing to a different print setting but yeah so that's how far away so let, let's actually I'm sorry let's answer that live so skirt brim so let's let's make this pretty substantial I'm gonna say 10 um, so remind me that I did that let's go ahead and slice this and now we should see when we do the simulate we should see that skirt brim being off the side and I, I remember I originally had that so I must be pointing to a different printer so there yeah absolutely you can see and I over exaggerated it so it's 10 millimeters away so this is kind of what I use personally for me to prime my nozzle and I also use it to make sure my bed is perfectly level I can kind of see what that looks like before it gets to the actual model so I, I usually do um, you know five or six passes around so yeah thank you um, James McDonald for answering that so okay cool well um, I know this is a little bit shorter than normal there wasn't a whole bunch to show I wanted to introduce you to this I highly recommend you try it out try some of the different settings and see what results you get one of the first things I did was I created a cylinder with a filleted edge and a chamfered edge and I printed it out of Cura and I printed it out of Fusion and I compared the two just to kind of see what they looked like and I was pleasantly surprised um, for as new as the slicer is in Fusion um, how well it did um, in fact you can see I mean this is I don't know how good how good it's gonna show up on camera or if it's even focus I mean that is some some nice looking detail I think this is kind of a, a sparkly purple um, I think I have yeah I do I have the same one in black um, you can kind of see this is a, a different model yeah it's not gonna focus I apologize guys but give it a try so see what you think and play around with it um, and hopefully you found this interesting and we will see you on our next live stream have fun fusioning